<clears throat> well, this morning, as I've told you numerous times, we're looking at the um, Eighth Commandment. And I'll uh, begin by reading it in Exodus 20, verse 15. You shall not steal. Now, as you know, we're um, going through a series on the, uh, what we call the rules of the race. And this morning, we want to continue that, uh, looking at the definition that God gives to us of love. He hasn't left it up to us to think about what is a loving thing to do to someone else because in, in well, but apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and because we still have flesh that we have to deal with, our definition will always fall short of what it needs to be. This is the Lord's definition. He knows what is loving and we need to listen to Him. This is the standard by which our Lord Jesus Christ lived. This is what the Spirit of God has written on our hearts in the New Covenant so that we might become like Jesus and that we might live in the way that he lived. This is what it means, what Eric Little meant when he said, it is complete surrender. To completely surrender to the Lord is to love him with all of our being and to do what he has called us to do out of love. Now this time we're looking at the Eighth Commandment, as I've already said, you shall not steal that tells us that we are to love God and we are to love our neighbor by protecting what belongs to them, by not taking what is theirs and by not withholding what is rightfully theirs. Now it doesn't take much imagination, perhaps it doesn't take any imagination at all, since most of us by this time in our lives have had something taken from us to know how it feels to be the victim of this crime. Uh, Donna, I have actually several <laughs> personal examples of this myself, uh, some having to do with me and some not, but Donna and I, years ago, were at a friend's house where we had gathered together with a group of brothers and sisters for some fellowship. And one of the brothers brought a guitar along with him so that we could spend some time you know, singing and, and worshiping. Well, at some point in our fellowship, he decided to set that guitar down at the side of the house, and we all went into the back. And probably not more than five minutes later, he came back to get the guitar, and the guitar was gone. Now, his reaction is probably a reaction that, that we often have, and that is, oh, I thought I put my guitar here. I must have put it somewhere else. So after looking around for it for quite some time and not finding it, he came back to the place where he thought he put it, and he's looking at it, and he says, it should be here but it isn't here. And it said it felt strange. Well, I had a similar experience in very similar circumstances when after a morning service one time at church, I went to someone's house, parked my car outside the house, went in for fellowship, came out later to where I had parked my car, and my car was gone. And my first response was, I must have parked it somewhere else. I thought I parked it here, it's somewhere else. After looking around for it, I realized it should be here, but it isn't here. Now, how do you feel when that happens? How do you feel when somebody takes something away from you? Well, I know how I felt. I felt like somebody had taken advantage of me. I felt like somebody had violated me. They had taken away something that belonged to me without my permission, and now I had to suffer the loss. Now, when that happens, you do not feel loved. And the reason why you don't is because that isn't love. Now our Lord tells us this morning that if we are to love Him and we are to love our neighbor as He loved His Father and as He loved others, we need to make sure that we don't take anything from anyone, but that we protect what belongs to others. Now what I'd like us to do this morning is to consider three things. Um, the first one is quite obvious, what the commandment is actually telling us. Secondly, what may or may not be obvious is the different ways it can be broken, and, and certainly there are many more ways than what I'm going to describe. But thirdly, and most importantly, what it teaches us about how we are to love others. So first of all, what does the eighth commandment, you shall not steal, tell us? Now, this one's pretty straightforward. It's not like the third commandment that requires perhaps a little bit more background, perhaps a little more understanding of the uh, Jewish culture 
As we look at the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We might think that essentially it means not to use the Lord's name as a common swear word. And certainly it means that. But it means more than that. It means that we are not to lift God's name up to bear witness or to call God to bear witness to something we promise to do or something we say is true when we're not intending on doing that thing or what we're swearing to is not true. We're basically calling upon God to bear witness to a falsehood. Now again, it takes a little bit of understanding of the Jewish culture to understand that that's what the Lord is saying behind the third commandment. But here, we don't have that ambiguity. Stealing is something, sadly, we're all familiar with. It's a problem that every culture has had to face at all times throughout history since the fall. And the reason why they have is because sin is universal, because we're all affected by sin, and because of the nature of sin. Sin is selfishness. Do you want to know whether you're sinning or not sinning? This is one of the ways you can tell quite quickly is, is what I am doing self-oriented or is it oriented towards the Lord and toward others? Not that we can't do things for ourselves, but we need to make sure that when we do them, we're doing them so we can do the other things the Lord calls us to do for Him. Sin moves us to do things for ourselves and here's the catch at the expense of others. It's self-oriented, it's selfishness, and it costs others rather than ourselves. The Lord tells us in this commandment not to take away what belongs to someone else. It not only hurts other people, it dishonors the Lord who wants us to love them, but also who wants us to respect what he has given to them. I mean, God has given it to them, not to us. We are not to take it away from them. Now, that's simply what the commandment means. But let's, let's go on to the second point. How can we break this commandment? Now, we may be surprised or we may not be that there are many ways in which we can steal, knowingly or even unknowingly. Now, the most obvious way is by taking something that belongs to someone else without their permission. When you take something that belongs to someone else and you don't have their permission, this amounts to stealing. It doesn't matter if that thing you take is big, like a car, or something small, like office supplies. If we don't have the permission of the owner, it's stealing, and we're breaking this commandment. Now, the Lord tells us that if we have stolen something, we do need to give it back. We need to make restitution. How can we say that we've repented of taking something that doesn't belong to us if we still hold on to it and we don't give it back? Well, the Lord says, you know, says this plainly in Numbers chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, and He says another couple of interesting things in here. Speak to the sons of Israel. When a man or a woman commits any of the sins of mankind, acting unfaithfully against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess his sins which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrong, and add to it one-fifth of it, and give it to him whom he has wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution which is made for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest besides the ram of atonement by which atonement is made for him. Well, the Lord tells us here at least that we need to give back what was stolen. And actually, as you go through the Old Testament, you find a number of different forms of restitution. Sometimes it's giving back double. Sometimes it's giving back many times as much. It depends on whether you have what you've taken or you don't have it, if you've liquidated it or not. If you don't, then there are certain things you have to do. But certainly it's clear the Lord wants us to give back what, we're, what we have taken. And if the person that we've taken from is gone, then we need to make restitution to a relative of that person. And if the person has no relative, then we are to give it to the Lord. In, in no case are we to hold on to it, you see. Now, we don't need to bring a sacrifice for the sin that we have committed 
in the form of an animal since the Lord has offered himself and he is the once for all sacrifice that we always bring for our sins. We just need to confess our sin to him and receive his forgiveness and we need to give back to our neighbor what belongs to him. Now, there are situations where you may, you may have done that. You may have taken something from your neighbor. Uh, perhaps years ago when, you know, you weren't a believer um, or perhaps even as a believer. But let's say you, you go to that person and you tell them what you've done. You confess your sin to them. You ask for their forgiveness. And then you offer to make restitution. If they say, don't worry about it, I forgive you the debt, then obviously in that case, you don't have to make restitution because they have the right to give you what it is that you have taken from them. But even if we haven't taken away someone else's possessions, there are still many other ways we can be guilty of breaking this commandment. And here's where we get into a, somewhat of a list. If we receive something that was stolen and we know it was stolen, then we become an accomplice to that theft. We still have something that doesn't belong to us without the permission of the owner. If we buy something that somebody stole, knowing that it was stolen, we're doing exactly the same thing. If we don't work as hard as we should for our employers, we're actually stealing from them. Um, I'm sure I could find personal examples of that as well. None of us really perhaps give the much as much as we should. But there was one that really stood out to me, not, not necessarily of my own, but one that I experienced or was a witness to. When I was working as a custodian at, at a school while I was going through college and seminary, uh, during the summers, they took the custodians, the whole crew that kind of worked on their own areas during the year, and they put them together into a, usually a room, one room at a time, and we'd have to do like a deep cleaning in that room. Inevitably, there was always one person there when the supervisor was gone who would always stop working. And when the supervisor was coming, somehow when he was on his way down the hall, the person would just start working right at the right moment. So when the supervisor came in, he would be working. But he wasn't working when the supervisor was gone and he was stealing because he had been hired to do a particular job and he wasn't doing the job. And not only was he stealing from the school, and from you know, the state that was paying the money, the wage for this, but he was also stealing from the rest of us because that, his activity, made us have to work harder to make up what he wasn't doing. And of course, he was also stealing from our reputation because when the supervisor came in, we hadn't gotten as much done as we should have because we were basically one man short because he wasn't, again, doing the work he was supposed to be doing. So that's another way of stealing. If we're able to work, but we don't work, instead we depend on others to support us or to do our work for us, such as this one person did I was just referring to. Or if we have others who depend upon us to take care of their needs, but we're unwilling to work, we're unwilling to provide for them, we are stealing from them because the Lord has ordained us to provide for them. We need to be willing to work especially if we've taken on that responsibility through marriage or by having children. We need to provide for them. If we're able to do it, we need to do it. If we take what we earned and we basically throw that money away, we spend it frivolously or maybe we, we gamble it away, we're taking away the support that the Lord has given to those under our care. We're stealing from them. Now, if we're guilty of any of these things, obviously we need to repent and we need to remember what it means to love. We need to renew our love to the Lord and to our neighbor, whoever that neighbor may be. But again, there's still many other ways that this law is broken in our society. One way that really stands out to me is frivolous lawsuits. People are sue happy today because they want, they want money and they don't care how they get that money. Uh, again, a personal example, one day my, my mother was, uh, you know, she, I think at this time she was in her late 80s, and she was in her car behind another car pulling out into a street. The first car goes out of the driveway and looks like it's going to go, and of course, you've been in a situation like this before where there's a car in front of you. You, you look, you think the car's going, you look to see if anybody else is coming, you assume that car is still moving because there's no cars in the way, 
but it's not moving. It stopped, and so you either slam the brakes really quick or you run into the back of that car. Well, on this particular occasion, my mother, well, this, this person pulled out. They stopped. My mother didn't see. She ran into the back of that car, but just barely tapped her bumper. They got out. Uh, the woman said, uh, don't worry. There's no damage to the bumper. I'm not hurt, but let's exchange insurance information anyway. So they did, and a couple of weeks later, my mother was served with papers that said she was being sued, sued for a neck injury, sued for damage to a car. And as the insurance company got involved and began to uh, look at what this woman's record was like, they found that she had something like four or five other lawsuits that were currently in the court for exactly the same thing. This woman was making a living by uh, feigning an accident with other people by causing the accident. When you get rear-ended, it's usually the, the person's fault behind you, so that's kind of a safe way to do it. But she was stealing. She was stealing. Same is true of blackmail, which this is perhaps one form of it. When someone tries to extort money from someone else under the threat of revealing something, that person doesn't want to, to get out, that's stealing. If you happen to damage somebody's property, or, you, or their car, maybe you hit a parked car and you decide to sort of scuttle off, you know, without trying to find the owner or leaving a note, you've done some damage. It's going to cost them money. You've taken away part of the value of their property. If you don't own up to it, that amounts also to stealing. Now, this isn't something I've, I've heard of recently, but I think people still do it. Moving the boundary markers around your property, making your property bigger, making theirs smaller. That's stealing. If you purposely sell something, let's say you're in a business and you misrepresent that, that thing in some way, this, you know, we, we've uh, <laughs> seen enough uh, health products, you know, that claim to, to just make you, again, new from top to bottom, and then when you try them, they don't actually pan out the way you expect them to. If they make false claims, that's stealing. If they tell you they're selling you a pound, but they're selling you 15 ounces, that's False weights, that's also stealing. And then my last example of stealing is kidnapping. Not that we're going to kidnap, at least I hope we're not going to kidnap anyone. But that is stealing as well, taking away somebody's freedom, the stealing of a human life. What was the problem with the slave trade? Why was it abolished? Because it involved kidnapping. It involved stealing human life. By the way, the penalty for stealing a human or kidnapping is much more severe than it is to steal anything else because it is a crime against God's image. Remember under the sixth commandment, we saw what a tremendous crime it is to destroy the image of God. Well, it's also a crime to deprive someone of their liberty and steal them and sell them to someone else. The Lord says in Exodus 21 verse 16, he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. This is the penalty that the Lord says kidnapping deserves. Now, I think we would all agree that we don't want to be the recipients of any of the things that we just looked at. If we are to love God and we are to love our neighbor, we must not take away what belongs to our neighbor in any form, in any way, without their permission. Now finally, we need to remember there's more here than just how not to injure our neighbor. The Lord is also telling us here how we are to love them. And I think all of this is important, but I think particularly uh, this, this area. Now first we are to love them, of course, by making sure that we don't violate the commandment by doing any of the things we just saw. And if we have done that, we need to love them by confessing our sin and making restitution for whatever that thing is. But secondly, we need to remember that this commandment, as well as all the others, not only forbids one thing, it also recommends something else. What the Lord tells us here is that we need to be those who give rather than those who take. And let me just remind you what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in our meditation earlier this morning, Ephesians 4.28. He says, He who steals must steal no longer, 
but rather he must labor, he must work, performing with his own hands what is good, it needs to be lawful work, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. So there is something here that the Lord is calling us to do, something he wants us to give our neighbor. And uh, what I'll, I'll summarize it is, is mercy. God wants us to show mercy. Mercy, I was thinking of the terms, you know, is, is mercy what we owe our neighbor? Well, in a certain sense we do, but in a certain sense not, because mercy, as you know, is something that is freely given and cannot really be earned. It's something that the person doesn't deserve, and you, you show them, or you don't give them what they do deserve. I suppose what you owe them is justice, but you don't necessarily owe them mercy. Mercy is something freely given, but the Lord commands us to show mercy, and so we must show mercy. We owe it to God to show mercy to others. Now this is what our Lord Jesus Christ says in Luke chapter 6 verses 30 through 36. Sometimes this is hard to live up to but this is what our Lord says. Give to everyone who asks of you and whoever takes away what is yours do not demand it back. Now if we take away something we need to go to them we need to make restitution. If they take it away from you Jesus says, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now Jesus is not saying here, if you do this, then you will be sons of the Most High. If you are the sons of the Most High, you will do this. But what he means by this is certainly this, that when you will do what Jesus calls you to do, you will show that you share the same nature that God does, that you are His children, you are His sons and daughters. That's what Jesus did. That's what we will do if we're being recreated in his image. We will reflect that same kind of love and mercy. Now mercy comes in many forms. Sometimes it means that we are to forgive, as Jesus just told us, forgive those who have sinned against us. Other times it means that we are to give. Now what we are to give depends on the need and whether or not we have the ability to meet that need. When we are to give depends on when the Lord may providentially bring across our path a particular need. But the point is, if we see the need and we can meet it, then we are to try to meet that need. We are to show mercy. Now, as we do that, let's not forget that when we do, who it is we're giving to or to whom we're giving, and that is the Lord. Solomon writes in Proverbs 19, verse 17, One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Now Jesus just said, if you see a need, give and expect nothing in return. Don't expect that person who is poor and needy to pay you back. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't expect the Lord to pay you back. Because when you give to the person who is in need, you're giving to the Lord. And the Lord is the one who is going to repay you. Remember that book I referenced a little bit earlier, uh, Riches Increased by Giving. How do you get rich by giving what you have away? Well, the riches come in a variety of forms, comes in spiritual blessings and so forth if you're doing it for the right reasons. But it also comes from the Lord giving to you. You can't outgive the Lord. So the Lord wants us to show mercy in our giving. He also calls us to minister the gifts that he has given to us 
as members of the body to the members of his body so that they will have what they need to grow in Christ. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 through 11, Peter writes this, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Lord has given us certain gifts. We are to realize that these gifts are His when we use them. We are to use what He has given us to serve others for His glory and His honor. But it's something we need to give. And as we give to one another in this way, we all benefit. We all grow up into the image of our Lord. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives gifts to the whole body, and as we exercise those gifts, the whole body grows. We all get stronger. But we don't get stronger if we withhold our gifts and don't minister them. If we withhold, we're breaking this commandment. The Lord wants us to give. He wants us to minister. That's why He gave us the gift. Now finally, uh, we've already seen in one of these previous passages that we are stewards of the manifold grace of God. He's given it to us as an investment. He has invested in us spirit, gifts, and various other things that we are to steward for His glory, and we are faithfully to steward what the Lord has given to us by using these things the way He wants us to use them, by investing them in His kingdom. Our time, our energy, our resources, and our gifts. On, on one occasion, our Lord Jesus was being asked whether it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And then Jesus said, well, show me a coin. And so they pulled one out and they said, whose who's, um, picture is on that coin? And they said, Caesar's. Well, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give to God the things that are his. There are certain things that the Lord has given to us that he wants us to give to him as a part of of our stewardship. So let's not forget to give him what is his. And basically, that's everything. Now, he does give to us, of course, some time, energy, resources, and so forth to take care of our needs, but we need to realize that that isn't all that he's concerned about. He wants us to give to him to advance his kingdom, and we need to make sure that we're faithful in that part of our stewardship as well. So if we don't show mercy to others, if we don't minister our gifts to others, if we don't give of our resources to advance the Lord's cause, we're, we're violating this commandment. We're taking what is rightfully, what rightfully belongs to someone else because that is what the Lord wants us to do. Now, if we have God's Spirit in our hearts, which we do if we've trusted Jesus, then we know that this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to want to do. We're going to, the Spirit of God is going to be moving us in that direction. We will use what He's given us to serve Him. We will show mercy to our neighbors. We will try to find better ways to use our gifts, to build up His people and His kingdom. We will give to advance His cause. We won't bury our talents in the ground, uh, only to, as it were, dig them up on the end and, and present what the Lord gave to us, we will make an increase, as it were, okay? We will use them to love and to honor our Lord. Now, again, we're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to fall short in many different ways, but we will love in this way. Remember, this is the definition 
of love. The Spirit is the Spirit of love. And He will, he will be moving us to do these things because this is what it means to love. Now, if this is not what is in your heart to do this morning at all, then I would again urge you to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, to ask Him to give you His Holy Spirit, to again put those laws in your mind, to write them on your hearts, to impress the image of our Lord Jesus Christ in you because He's the only one who can do that so that you might trust Him and that you might turn from your sins, your selfishness, and begin to give as the Lord calls you to give. Remember the Lord tells us it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's something that applies in a variety of ways. But the Lord doesn't want us to be takers. He wants us to be givers. So may the Lord give us grace to give in the way the Lord calls us to give. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do that.